we become more efficient at detecting threats. And so in some ways, we are winning the race disproportionately by using AI. So I think from a security standpoint, uh, you know, AI, if we put our minds and apply it, can actually strengthen our defenses. And the nature of the field right now, we think about you know, sort of a relatively small number of companies, mostly in the United States, that are doing most of the driving, the announcing, raising a lot of money. We've got a fair number in China too, though with very different capabilities. Do you think that is likely to persist for, let's say, two, three years? Or do you think it's much more likely that this field is going to have massive churn? both in terms of the principal players, but also in terms of where they are and what they do? It is a very dynamic moment. I think it's important to understand this technology flows freely. In fact, a lot of the AI revolution was underpinned by work we published from Google uh, called Transformers. There is uh, a lot of research still being shared, and people are open sourcing models as well. You mentioned US and China, but I think it's important even in the context of Europe, there are extraordinary companies uh, in Europe. Mistral in France, Hugging Face in France, Aleph Alpha in Germany. So there are important companies uh, you know, who are really driving progress with AI here as well. And I think open source adds a dimension to it. Having said that, I do think the larger scale models require a lot of investment in capex and uh, in, in computing. So I think you energy. Uh, and, and energy to go with it. And, and so I do think you're going to have large players continue to lead the way. But I do think there is a, under, underneath that, there is more dynamism than people realize. Very tight responses from engineers, by the way. <laughs> you should note this going forward. So Kirsty, let me turn to you and ask, um, given all of this, given the state of where we are, um, how do you think about governance from a state perspective and from a maybe more than state perspective? There's a lot of focus over it. The EU has one approach, the Americans have another, the Chinese have a third, the UN is engaged. It's trying to move pretty fast, not moving as fast as this. Give us some of your thoughts on where we are, where we should go. Yes, indeed. For years now here in Munich, we have been discussing this, that uh, in past century when something was invented, governments know best about it. And onboarding also in our defense and security technologies, we now need to, I mean, onboard what has been invented in the private sector. And uh, so this is not new for us. Right now we are just adding this element of, of, of legality, of onboarding private sector into our uh, international multilateral legal process. What I mean by it, the number of governments is far bigger than the number of companies who are, I mean, that big in this. And uh, I think we will in 10 years time, since you started from that, see that actually they are, uh, well, at the comparable level participating in our legal space setting. And I think this is something which we need to get our head around. And it's the best way to do it, because we're not able to do it without them. They are not so numerous. And actually, I mean, the responsible companies who work with us will help us to uphold this new international digital world order. The trick here, of course, is um, can we trust, despite all the geopolitical competition between, let's say, US and China, can we really trust that Chinese, despite these competitive elements in our uh, relations, let's put it very politely, Despite that, are they able to come together and agree and control the way we think it should be done? Or will be, they be overtaken by the will to dominate? We restrict ourselves, they don't restrict themselves. Or they make face, they do, but finally they don't. In case of the nuclear proliferation, somehow governments were able to come together and actually do I mean, overcome the other difficulties and say, this is a real existential risk. We must be able to cooperate. And interestingly, NSC is starting uh, this year a program to help uh, our generation of people to understand nuclear risks, proliferation risks, and how actually to, I mean, handle them to make sure that we are able step by step patiently move ahead. I think we should actually approve the same strategy. The main problem, of course, in addition to this US-China competition and can we work together is the, uh, the uh, non-government actors or malign actors. 
uh, they are far more difficult to, com uh, to control, and of course they can rely on small language models, which are more specific, uh, less uh, energy consuming, and far more difficult to detect. So the only way to try to, I mean, keep them in check now and hopefully also in 10 years' time, is to monitor the energy expenditure and try to control where the chips are going. I don't see any other ways. That is the real danger. The small, irresponsible groups having, well, having, uh, having some SLMs rather than LLMs. The proliferation model is clearly a much greater challenge in this environment than the nuclear model exponentially. But to ask you to push a little on the US-China front, uh, do you see that? as one where, I mean, there is an effort to put a track 1.5 together. It's gonna be rolling out in the next several weeks between the United States and China. Do you see that as something that should be done at the top levels of the government, driven by Beijing and Washington, irrespective of the administration? Or do the Europeans necessarily need to be a component of that? Are the, are the corporations sitting around the table irrespective of who they are, if they're the principal players, or is there a selection process? And how might you think about who the right actors are? What, what do you, what do you as, as someone who used to run a government in this space, and, and as a European who isn't necessarily driving AI right now, how do you think about that? Well, I think that Europe has always been the champion in testing regulation, and therefore it has its value also in this process. If I think of the EU AI Act, I'm very happy that we have it. It's the most comprehensive. The US done quite a lot of I, I mean, uh, attempts at legislation as well. But it's comprehensive, and I like it. There is only one element which I'm worried, and the problem here is that actually the AI Act foresees pretty high fines. And if you go and, and tell somebody that I mean, unless you abide by my rules, I will fine you by 35 million or 7% of your turnover or on a lesser violations so that are 15 and 3.5 and so on. Unless you're an SME, then there are again different rules. But then the risk is that you cannot really, I mean, achieve what I envisaged as the proper regulation which onboards the private sector because they're not open with you. And, and Estonian experience, Estonia, well, is a government which relies very much on digital tools. And for us, it's kind of vital to keep the system running that our uh, uh, critical infrastructure providers talk with government openly about their cyber risks and actually attacks and failures in their cybersecurity. And for that, you cannot find them. We don't. And it works very well. So I would advise that AI Act could be the base for this I mean, common coming together to make sure that AI keeps, is kept under control. But I would, I would say minus, minus the fines. That's a huge problem right now in the system. Now, Nigar, I'm about to turn to you. But first, I have to ask you, Sundar, I mean, since uh, Kirsty just said that you know, the Europeans have always been the champions of the most effective new regulatory structure, does Google see it that way? Minus the fines. Does Google see it that way on AI? and the EU AI Act? Look, I, I think there's definitely been value we see in a digital single market, and I think Europe was definitely at a disadvantage with fragmented regulation on the internet across many different countries. So for example, for privacy, I think we've called for federal privacy legislation in the US. Uh, and the fact that GDPR exists as a business gives you a certain framework on which to approach your work. Having said that on AI, to answer your question directly, I think it's important, it's a transformative moment, it'll affect every sector, including the competitiveness of Europe as a whole. So you have to balance and get, get it right where you're promoting innovation and companies can lean in and adopt AI. Uh, at the same time, you know, making sure there is responsibility to go with it. So, you know, it's a tricky balancing act, I think. And, 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 and I think it's important for Europe to keep that balance as they proceed here. Okay, I'm hearing a transatlantic perspective from Sundar here, not, not shockingly. So, Nigha, let me turn to you, because we haven't talked, of course, yet uh, about the rest of the world, and I'm gonna make you responsible for all of it. So, uh, Global South, I mean, the models so far, driven from the industrialized world and companies there, a lot of the data, of course, is also coming from those people, wealthy people, largely speaking. Uh, what do we do, what needs to be done 
Is anything being done that helps ensure, in your view, that these technologies will not drive greater inequality, will not drive greater, I mean, we've seen it on climate change. I mean, the increase, the global south, is the political component. It's not an economic component. We used to talk about emerging markets. That meant they were gonna engage and integrate. The global south is we're different because we feel like you're not treating us properly. It, how do you address that? So um, first of all, I guess um, uh, when we talk about global south, we also need to think that we are talking about rest of the world, which is global majority. And it's not the global minority that usually where, where the con conversation around AI is uh, concentrated. It's a handful uh, of companies, handful of governments who are driving this conversation, whether it comes to regulation or whether it comes to innovation. And as we See, China, you know, they love to produce and EU loves to regulate and US loves to innovate. And where is the rest of the world? So I guess uh, so far in this, what I personally think is global majority or global south hasn't been part of this conversation. We have always been treated as first design, de uh, design technology, regulate it, and then deploy, and then that's where we, we sort of come into the picture. But I think with, with this whole AI conversation, one thing that I have noticed that, for instance, uh, companies are talking about, governments are coming up with regulations, but also UN stepped in. So UN Secretary General established his uh, high-level AI panel. You are also part of it. And uh, I think that's a good conversation starter in terms of of, you know, when, when we talk about uh, global governance, somebody has to govern this. Somebody has to do an oversight, not only on companies, but also nation states. Uh, how governments are coming up with regulations, whether those regulations uh, are taking into account international human rights framework or international human rights law. And I think we should not think about security in isolation. If we look at our founding UN founding documents, it basically talks about peace, security, and human rights. So are we really taking that conversation into this debate? I think we are departing from uh, human rights and international human rights framework when we are talking about these emerging technologies. I'm glad that companies are thinking something, but I think they are not thinking enough and the actions that they are taking. So maybe this is like a proper time. I, I, I don't want to uh, uh, say things in a pessimistic note because I, I can see dif different struggles that are going on when it comes to governments and companies, but also uh, entities like UN is also trying to be part of the debate and then independent oversight boards also are trying to do their best. So I think we need to look into the ecosystem and how we are adding into ecosystem instead of just working in silos. So when I, when I think about what you just told us all, uh, three different kinds of points come to mind. The first is negative externalities. And so, you know, lots of people, lots of companies, lots of shareholders are gonna benefit from AI, but if they're gonna be negative externalities, usually it's the people that don't have power that get hit, and that's probably something that bothers you, number one. Number two um, is, this is an incredible technology to empower human beings to increase their human capital, to, to do things that they, I mean, we were just talking behind, you know, sort of the stage on how everyone can be a programmer now because the skill set required to be an effective programmer is a lower base. So we'll get more programmers in Pakistan. We'll get more programmers in Sub-Saharan Africa. That's really exciting. And then there's a third point, which I don't know how to think about yet, and I'm hoping you can help me which is that increasingly I see a lot of governments also wanting to have and roll out sovereign AI for their countries. But of course, those governments have radically different governance models. And some of them are kind of democratic. Most of the African models are not, right? And what does that mean for individuals that happen to live in a country where sovereign AI may be doing stuff that has nothing to do with the principles of the UN Charter? Talk us through how you relate to those very different drivers. Yeah, no, I, 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 I understand, you know, you're talking about some governments that are less democratic or, you know, um, autocratic regimes, but, but I think we, and that, that's where, you know, I always stress when it comes to companies or governments that, yes, there is UN Charter, but th that, it was there for some reason, and that's why, you know, UN Business Human Rights Council ha puts some responsibility on business 
and governments both. And I think that's why we have to look into the international human rights framework, because when it comes to governments, they also depart from human rights uh, conversation when they make regulations. You know, so mostly it's like concentrating their own power or national security or their own security. And I think that's where it's important for us to keep reminding governments to look back into the documents or the commitments that they have made to the UN, but also companies the responsibilities that they have under uh, UNSG, uh, UN guiding principles. Now, I, I want to at least talk about this announcement that's being made shortly on this Munich Pact, uh, which is bringing together a number of tech companies, including Google, also bringing together other governments as participants to try to root out AI disinformation from elections. Pakistan has just had kind of an election, right? Sort of, right? Not, not a great one. I think we can say that. Um, and, and one of the things that was interesting was Imran Khan from jail, right, doing this AI speech. It wasn't him. It was kind of put forward. D do you see um, an, an, a pact that would root out AI as making any sort of difference in a country like yours? I think uh, um, I think that it's 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 a question that I also raised, you know, during our elections when when political parties were doing election campaigning uh, while using platforms and how generative AI was being used by different political actors and other actors as well. And I think uh, what I noticed noticed that platforms are not as ready because a lot of impact of generative AI is it's not it's not black and white. It's not that oh you know a political leader behind the bars is using AI gen. It's basically you know what kind of narrative you know coming out of you know uh through generative use of generative AI, but also you know the impact of user. Who are these people consuming that content? Do they know whether that was AI generated content? You know, like they, 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 there is a lack of digital literacy. People actually don't know when a leader who is so much celebrated that people will blindly believe, no matter they are populist or right wingers or whatever. But then if they are blind, they blindly believe them. They won't care that this is generative AI content or not. So I think there is a lot of converse, there are a lot of streams we are talking about here but uh, I won't go into uh, what kind of elections we had just so and that's no, that's fair I'm not, I'm not trying to put you on the hot spot on that but so Kirsty from the government from the government perspective uh, Sundar from the corporate perspective how excited should we be that this is a significant step forward in an area that so far there's been virtually no governance <laughs> you mean tech accord or yes accord. Yeah, first I wanted to a little bit take issue with this, that this new technology is, is only a risk for the human dignity. It definitely can also be used to defend and protect human dignity. And my belief is strongly that GDPR was born precisely because we wanted to defend our values. And now even you say that it was useful. It's a useful framework. And also the AI Act actually does ban uh, AI activities which violate uh, human rights, for example, social scoring, etc., is totally, totally forbidden. And that is why I'm also skeptical that can it really develop into a kind of common accord. But what com uh, if we come now to the uh, Munich Compact, full disclosure, I've also been, uh, well, let's say, somewhat involved from Microsoft side in, in getting this uh, thing done. And I really appreciate this corporate responsibility and, and and particularly, I mean, there has been a little bit less maybe interest from European companies also because they are facing in April a vote on AI Act and they may feel that, I mean, let's wait and see a little bit before we work with this document. But uh, it, it's concentrating uh, on the fact that we have a really bad year to test all these deep faking capabilities out. Maybe less of a problem in Europe because, after all, even if European Parliament finally consists of, of people who otherwise will not be there and, and are really weird, then it's mostly the Commission and Council problem in, in trialogues. They can resolve it. But there are other elections going on. And, and that means that companies have to come together and make sure that the deep fakes are busted. Because in the elections, which already we've now had, we've seen already that, uh, that these uh, models have allowed, I mean, amazing amount of fakes. And, and I really welcome this initiative. But it doesn't, of course, remove the problem that finally no one trusts anything anymore. And then if a government says somebody has invaded our country and we need to have a mobilization, you wouldn't believe it. And that is the outcome of all it. And this tech accord doesn't want 
this to happen, companies have come together and invited everybody else to onboard to do something about it, to, I mean, create fingerprints which we can attach to those things which are real and yep. also to bust what is unreal. And, and I mean, since governments cannot do it because you are in a pre-election phase, imagine, let's say that, I mean, US government goes or French government goes and says, six months before the election, I want to limit somehow the capability of deep faking. Politically almost impossible. It's right? not possible. So that actually that is why we are very we must be very grateful that companies took this action. That's a very important point. And I mean please answer this from the tech perspective, but also I'm just wondering how existentially urgent does this feel to you specifically given the elections in the United States this year? Uh, Look, I mean, election integrity has been something, uh, you know, we've been very focused on for a while. This year, not just in the U.S., I almost think one in three people in the world are going through an election, electoral process in, uh, in 24. And so it's an important year. I think there's a lot of work we have learned now works. Uh, I think compared to where the tech industry was a few years ago, we have made a lot of progress. There is more information sharing. I'm excited that the Tech Accord is one more step by which companies are coming together. For example, we have had success with running pre-bunking campaigns. By pre-bunking campaigns, we mean, and we plan to do the same for the European elections, uh, rather than debunking, get ahead of disinformation, identify patterns of how they've done it in the past, and educate people about what to look for. So it's like minority report before elections. <laughs> it's very exciting. It's a version of, yeah, telling people what kind of, uh, you know, to watch out for these patterns, right? And, and as to how these campaigns work, we are definitely introducing new policies. For example, we have updated our elections ads policy to say if you're using synthetic content, you need to disclose it as an advertiser. We are all introducing watermarking and as part of the tech accord, we're gonna share frameworks to do that. The technology is still early. When it comes to deep fakes though, I would say at least in the context of this year, what we have so far seen is still the same problem of uh, disinformation. You know, deep fakes is just a new way to create that. You can just, you don't need AI to create uh, uh, yeah, but wrong. AI gets all the blame anyway for any fake note. Uh, uh, yeah, right. And, but, but, you know, at least in 24, I, I think it's yet to be seen. But so far, you know, we haven't seen a wide-scale deployment of it. The, the New Hampshire robocall was probably the closest we've seen in the U.S. so yes, far. Yes, but people became aware of aware it. Aware of it very quickly. Very quickly, yeah. widely talked about, and, and, and so on. Was so, that a successful response in your view? You know... I think it's a start. I think mm -hmm. the fact that it quickly became, but you know, there's more to do, right? How do you detect it automatically and, and help users identify that it's AI generated? I think that's important work we all have to do. Kirsten, you look like you want it in. Is that true? No, I mean, for me, it's also important that companies are not myopic in this sense that you remember when 3D printers came suddenly everybody was calling their dumb kind of, let's say, plywood cutting uh, machinery a plywood printer, a 3D plywood printer. And the same now here applies. I mean, that not all faking is, is I mean, you have text fakes, you have uh, audio fakes, you have just, I mean, cutting weirdly this uh, Tucker Carlson interview or even talking rightly, try cutting rightly and presenting it, it's a weird material. So not everything is AI, but AI gets all the blame. And this is something which I hope companies, I mean, understand that, I mean, it's hopeless to explain to wider public what is AI and what isn't. They only care about what is true and what isn't. No, there are lots of reasons why democracies are increasingly broken, clearly. And AI is kind of the sprinkles right now yeah, on we top can of do, the Yeah, we can do most of the trouble ourselves, frankly speaking. We don't need AI, I mean, to talk stupid things. So I'm going to take um, a couple questions if people have them. So think them through, and I'll call, I'll call on you first. But before I do, I've got one more thing I want to... Oh, hold on one second. Um, but I wanted to get to... I just wanted to sort of seed that idea for a second. Um, I wanted to ask... We've talked a lot about governance and about the EU model, the US model. I'm interested also in the corporate model. And what I mean by that is I would argue, I would stipulate that there is a bigger difference in governance between Dorsey's Twitter 
and Musk's X, not only in terms of how it's run, but impact on society, than there was between um, Trump's US government and Biden's US government. I'd make that argument. Um, to the extent that Google, Microsoft, Meta, X are very different companies, and they also can have different CEOs, they can have different technologies, different business models, how should we think about technology companies as geopolitical actors? How should we think about just how dramatically those transitions can occur and, and the responsibility of regulation and governance to help ensure that that doesn't have negative implications for society? Of course, I'm thinking about the failures of social media around that and the fact that we're living with it. But with AI, this is all happening so much faster with so many implications. And I'll, I'll let you all answer that if you like, but I want to, of course, turn to you first. Look, you're seeing various models, right? I mean, Europe has the Digital Services Act, which kind of tries to, you know, it's a governance model on top of how does information flow in these platforms, right? So I think, I think there are attempts like that. Uh, I do think what matters is that there is a, I think the real issue is if there are only concentrated sources of information, right? But, you, you know, you, if anything, I think there is an element of democratizing access, which has been going on for a while. You have many different mediums now. So people are getting information, uh, you know, in many different ways. And sometimes I think we err on the side of thinking things are getting worse all the time, right? I think there is equally enough flows of information to counter things and, you know, and, and so I think time will tell. Uh, you know, there have been moments where things have gone wrong, but overall I wouldn't underestimate what the internet has done in terms of giving everyone access to more information. None of us know what misinformation looked like in the 1700s. I can assure you there was a lot of it, right? And, you know, I can't tell with absolute certainty things are worse today than it was then, right? But we sometimes talk that way. So, you know, I guess, you know, to, to me, the fact that there is more choice than ever before and, and, and people can hear from a wide variety of sources is, is a good thing. And, uh, and so that's how I think about it. I guess what, what, the one thing, I'm just a quick follow-up, and then I'll to you, Kirsty, which is um, we all, in this room, there is a general view shared by most people that a U.S. model of governance on AI would be preferable to a Chinese model of governance on AI, or a European model would be preferable, maybe to both, but certainly to, to the Chinese. Um, there is not necessarily a view that Google winning uh, the AI race is preferable to Microsoft, is preferable to X. And I'm not asking you to say Google's the best or the worst. That's, that's, I, I'm not asking you to do that. But I am asking, do you think it is important increasingly, given the role of companies in this space, for us to think more about the implications of different business models and different leaders being successful or not in this space? The geopolitical, the social, the political implications. Because again, for social media, that didn't happen. And clearly, a lot of countries, a lot of societies are paying for that. Look, I would, I would argue, and to your point, I think what matters ultimately is that, you know, that however the system wins, that it's grounded in a framework of human rights and shared uh, values that we can all underpin it on. And I genuinely think there will be many companies which will succeed in AI. It feels early and very far from a zero-sum game for me. And I do think this technology will get democratized more than people realize. Just like from the personal computer when you went to mobile phones, I would argue emerging markets, Global South, has had more penetration of mobile compared to the prior technology. I think AI will do the same, right? It will increase access of technology to more people than the previous technology generation. So, I think what matters is that it's underpinned with you know, a set of shared human rights and aligned values 
uh, you know, which, which, is, which is the most important thing, I think. Thank you. Now, Kirsty, you're smiling. Yes, I'm not smiling. sure I know what that means. That means that as all of a sudden, because you obviously you brought in Twitter versus X, you got the most diplomatic answer, similar to what I would say if you asked me to criticize US foreign policy, for example. But I'm not part of the corporate world, so, so I would be very blunt here. If there is shareholder value in being a rouge actor, then we have a problem. A but rogue actor. Is there? Yes. Because actually, mm. if you are a rouge actor and unpredictable, actually you do create risks to your own investment environment, maybe eating up shareholder value and destroying shareholder value. So that's my answer to this question of Twitter and leaks undiplomatically. So I thought you were going to say if I were asking you about Estonia versus Latvia, you were going to be very diplomatic. Absolutely. But absolutely. Okay. Nija, would you like to? throw an idea on this? Yeah, no, I, 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 I think there is a lesson learned for all of us, but, but especially companies, for uh, what happened to Twitter, uh, former Twitter and now X. Uh, power sh around one platform uh, should not be with the founder or one person in the company. And I think that's what the lesson, le lesson learned when we, see, when we see now X, that it still has an impact in societies where democracies are fragile. But also, I think what we witnessed that uh, th 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 there were these lays off of human rights teams and trust and safety teams, and I think that's where existing companies who are now uh, in this race of AI, they really need to see whether they are strengthening their existing human rights, trust and safety teams. Are they, uh, do they have any other body that can also hold them accountable, independent oversights, which are meaningful independent oversights? So I think they're like all these governance models that we can look into and not only the regulatory approach, but also like how companies are le learning their lessons from from the ones that are uh, actually still um, ruining, you know, whatever democracies we have left in the rest of the world. Thank you for that. So very different perspectives here. I think you had the first one, right? Yes. Yeah, so please, I'm going to two quick questions, and then we'll let the panelists respond. I'm going to take them both together so we don't run out of time. Please, first you, and then you. Yeah. And, and if you just uh, introduce yourself so that everyone can see who you are. <laughs> Thank you, Ulrike Franke from the European Council on Foreign Relations. Um, given that this is a security conference, we haven't talked, or I'd like to talk a little bit more about the security and, in fact, military implications of everything we're talking about. And I guess my question is primarily to Sundar Pijai. Um, you know, we see tech becoming increasingly relevant in military conflicts, and Google has been active in Ukraine, for example, around cybersecurity. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on the role that companies, which are after all private actors with unelected leaders, and the role that these companies can, should, or should not play in geopolitical conflicts, and how do you even approach this question um, of the role that you can play? Thank you. Okay, the next question is going to be easier, I promise. Uh, hand it to, please. I'm from Deutsche Welle. My question is also to you. you. We did mention Pakistan and a bit of uh, America. I'd be interested in understanding what specific steps Google is planning to take for the upcoming elections in India, because at the moment it seems like the maximum amount of disinformation is coming out of India. Thank you. So two questions. Uh, look, first of all, on cybersecurity, I do think companies have a strong role to play. Uh, if you looked at a few decades ago, uh, and even from a military standpoint, a lot of the underlying technological progress was being driven by the government, right? But that's changing now, right, pretty dramatically. Uh, take AI as an example. So I do think there are going to be increasing, you know, public-private partnerships. Uh, and I gave the earlier example of cybersecurity. If you look at the cybersecurity approach we have inside a company like Google, it is state of the art, and uh, in a way in which I think governments have a lot to you know, learn and work together and improve in terms of cybersecurity practices. And, and I think it's important that we create frameworks by which that can happen. So and I think that's going to be important. And, you know, in, in, and we do that uh, you know, consistent with our values uh, in, in, in democratic uh, countries. And look, we have, you know, in every country we operate, we have clear policies, and we publish those policies. 
we consult and evolve those policies and, you know, and, and would approach it the same way, be it in the US, be it in India. And, and I think as a company, we have always stood for raising what we call as authoritative information, uh, including pointing to new sources in important areas. Uh, that's what we have done across the world. And part of what in Google search we have done for many, many years is uh, in areas where we feel it's important to get the right information, we elevate what we call authoritative content, including journalistic content. You know, that's an approach which has worked well across our platforms in all the countries we work in. In, in, the military, you want, sure. yeah. in the military world, I would say that we, we have technology. We could sit back and enjoy drones fighting, but for some reason, motivated infantry and 155 millimeter ammunition still needed. I didn't catch the last bit. It's still needed. I mean, right. infantry and ammunition for some reason. It would be very nice to sit and allow drones to fight, but it's not happening. No, I, I mean, your point as well on disinformation. I mean, obviously, new technologies is changing warfare. We saw Turkey, Armenia, Azerbaijan shift with drones. AI clearly is playing a role, cyber, Ukraine. But at the end of the day, uh, a lot of bombs and rockets still making, and people, people on the ground making a difference. But AI is moving very fast. Do not sleep on AI. Next year, this conversation is likely to be more different than any other shift in any other topic that we will be addressing at Munich. And so, but, but great to kick it off nonetheless this year on the main stage. Uh, with that, Nigar Kirsti and Sundara, thank you all. Please join us uh, in thanking our panel today. Thank you.